right, get your Bibles out, Psalm 77. Uh, we're not wrapping up this year as we are in a sense of just kind of bringing all the teaching uh, really to this moment. And then obviously we'll take just a few minutes next week and we'll get into more of the experience of the encounter. Uh, but I want to share something with you. I really have felt along the lines of this series, um, I wasn't focused so much on the miracle itself. I, 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 we've, Pastor Dave launched us out just like a rocket into, into faith. And so we needed to build our faith. And, and so then the next couple of weeks, I spent time talking about faith is not an emotion. It's a, more of a position and, you know, how you position yourself to receive what God has, n- not based at all on how you feel. And then uh, the second week I preached, I talked about really the basis of our faith is love, how much you believe God loves you, not how much love you believe you can generate towards God. And then Pastor Cody did a great word uh, last week on proximity and faith, you know, engaging your faith and being close. And then today, I really wanna talk to you for a little bit about the process. And I think it's important because when we, when we would like, I don't know if we would define faith, whatever the definition would be, and I didn't look it up for, I didn't, we obviously we kind of know what that is, but I think in our definition we would add instantaneous. Like I, I just think we come from a, a mindset. If a miracle only happens like instantly in a moment, if anything else is not really a miracle unless it happens like that, right? And 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 I think that that's wrong thinking. In fact, when I look at the scripture, most miracles it seems like to me a lot of them happen in a process. And I want to encourage you, I believe that's the case I've seen that in my own life and in engaging with other people. Don't discount the miracle if it comes by process. In fact, that's probably how more of them will work. And and the reality is in that is because you're walking something out in faith, which is always good. And God wants you to grow and God wants you to learn along the way. And your answer can come in process as much as it can come instantaneous. In fact, your answer can come through obedience in fact, that's actually a bit more of a blessing because I think of how many times I want some God to meet my need instantly and it doesn't happen. I can get disappointed or discouraged, but I can obey the word of God every day of my life. I don't have to have a miracle morning. I'm excited about next week. Don't, don't hear that. And I'm excited about next week that God's gonna do amazing things. But listen, I don't have to live from miracle morning to miracle morning to miracle morning to miracle meeting to guest speaker to whatever, right? I can operate the word of God, the miracle word of God in my life every single day. And so my obedience is activating the miraculous in my life. And so I wanna talk a little bit this morning about the process, if you will. Psalm 77, 14, you are currently, present tense, you are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. Let me read this in the Living Bible. You are the God of miracles and wonders. You still demonstrate your power And I believe that completely. God still works today. You are, you still, you are, you. You know, probably those words need to be a part of our everyday communication with God. Declare it. Say what you believe. Say it out loud. Let yourself hear it. Say it out loud. I love the miracle stories in the word. I've taught most all of them I can remember over the years. And I love, I love, love, love miracle stories. But it's not just about the miracle. It's about the principle. And I think because then we're just chasing a miracle and we need to be chasing the miracle worker, amen? We need to be chasing not the power, but we need to be chasing the presence of God. And that's where it all comes from. And so there's lessons in miracle stories, I think that will help us, that we can be connected to his presence, not just connected to his power. And let me say this, his presence doesn't follow his power, his power follows his presence, amen? So you create environments to get in those moments of the presence of God and the miraculous can happen. The supernatural can take place. And so if we're uh, not careful, we can become more dependent upon uh, moments um, for our miracles instead of the miracle worker. We can focus on the miracle instead of the miracle worker. And I want to encourage you, by no means in saying what I'm going to say today, am I discounting next week? Next week, we've been praying and believing God to just really move in our hearts and our lives, creating an environment for that. So sometimes miracles are instantaneous, and sometimes, if not most times, they're a process. So let's take a look at John 9. Here's a story, one of my favorites, John 9, 1 through 3. We'll find some great principles here, and we'll learn about a process and the miraculous in the process. So let me start. Let me set it up. Uh, This is about a blind man that Jesus has an encounter with, and we know through Scripture he's had encounters with other blind men, and he's laid hands on them, and they've been healed and he's just spoken a word and they've been healed. Something different happens in this one. And I think because of the different, I like it. And I think there's some reasons why it's different and some principles we can learn from it. So let's take a look. Start. Let me start reading in verse one. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth and his disciples asked him saying, Rabbi, whose sin this man or his parents 
that he was born blind. Interesting question. Um, I can't imagine the discussion just seeing somebody walking through something and automatically you're gonna ask why or how. It must have been Peter, right? Peter's just like, hey, I got an idea. Hey, what happened here? And uh, I like Peter though because he gives us a lot of sermon material <laughs> and a lot of principles to live by. But what I find interesting in this question is they were looking for fault, if I can say it that way. They're looking for cause, they're looking for reason. Why, how did this happen, where did this come from? Their first response was about fault. It wasn't even a compassionate response, you know, needing to meet the need of, it was like, hey, let's talk for a second. Uh, who's at fault here? Now Jesus responds this way in verse three. He says this, Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents have sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I wanna spend a moment talking about this scripture because I think number one, Jesus points us back, gets us back on track. He's like, it doesn't matter how this came about. It doesn't matter who's at fault. What matters is God has the answer. God is the one that can meet the need. And, and what I find interesting about this question posed by the disciples and Jesus' response is I believe Jesus is trying to refocus them. They were focused on fault and Jesus was trying to refocus them on faith. Can I say that for a second? I think a lot of times there's a danger in you and I when we hear something, feel something, see something, experience something, that we can spend more time focusing on fault, if you will, and not be focused on faith. In fact, the more you focus on fault, the more discouraged or depressed you'll be. It really is an enemy to your faith. So our immediate response, and we have a choice when we are confronted or experience something is, are you gonna focus on fault or are you gonna focus on faith? Now what Jesus does is refocuses us on faith by his comment, which I'll explain in just a moment, but the importance of that is, it's again making sure that we're not focused on the wrong thing, but having said that, when our faith is then refocused on the right thing or God, then I do think it's important to go back and see, is there something I've done in my life to create this or cause this? Did I create a financial calamity? Did I create a health calamity? Did I create a relational calamity? Or however you wanna say that. So don't hear me in that. You need to understand what you do and make adjustments, but after you focus on faith then, and now you can move forward. So Jesus responds, neither this man nor his parents sinned, so let's not even focus on that. He says, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I wanna spend a moment here on this because I think it's important for us to understand God is a healer. God does not put things on us. Now, in reading the scripture, I can get why some people teach this, almost. I mean, yes and no, if you just wanna focus on that scripture, not the rest of the Bible. If you wanna focus on the wording here and not the character and nature of God, but what we have to understand here is what Jesus is implying is something different, but what we draw from is knowing God's character and his nature is he loves you, he's for you, he heals, he delivers, he sets free. He doesn't put sickness and disease or calamity and tragedy on your life to teach him something as if God all of a sudden puts something on you so he can come around later and heal you and get the glory for that. What father does that? My natural father never did that. I know, son, this is gonna be hard for you right now, but trust me, I'm gonna come back and this is gonna be great in this moment, right? And I just thought, like, that's not even lines up with the character and nature of God, so Jesus must be implying something else. And I think it's important for us to understand what I believe Jesus was saying here is for every situation you find yourself in, it's not about the fault, it's about your faith. And he's refocusing us. In other words, let me say it this way, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Whatever you experience in life, you can say the works of God should be revealed in this situation. Amen. I just got, I got a bad diagnosis from the doctor. And if someone was to come up to me and say, Pastor Don, I just got a bad diagnosis from the doctor. My first response should never be, well, if it, I, the doctor diagnosed me with cancer, my first response should never be, well, have you been smoking your whole life? Have you been drinking your whole life? Have you been you know, living in an unsafe environment your whole life? Uh, is it a family history of yours? Uh, I don't know, maybe it was passed on down in your DNA. I, I don't know. My first response would be, the works of God can be revealed in this right here. And Pastor Don, I'm having a hard time in, in my marriage right now. We're really struggling. And well, what's the problem? Are you, are you not being nice to her? Is she a nag? Are you a jerk? I mean, what's the, what's the, are you being selfish? Are you not serving here? I mean, what's going on? Did you marry the wrong one, the right one? I mean, all the things that we try and find fault with and stuff. What I should say is the works of God should be revealed in your marriage. 
Well, Pastor Don, my teen is addicted to drugs and he's just walked away from God and, and I'm just afraid for him. He's just in danger. I'm not sure if he's gonna come back. My first response shouldn't be, well, don't you watch him better? Do you have curfews? Are you not monitoring him? You should have grounded him more, spanked him more. Is he running with the wrong crowd? My first response be for your teen, the works of God should be revealed in their lives. Don't lose faith. But don't focus on faults. And that'll suck the faith right out of you. And so I believe what Jesus is doing is redirecting and basically what he's saying to you and I, whatever, whatever it is, how many times, how many days, no matter what, how big, how small, the works of God should be revealed in your life in that situation. Amen. I love Jesus not just going over, the, not just passing by this, but stopping for a moment to refocus faith here. Because I think a lot of our time is, is caught up in the how, the why, why me? Why, why not that mean guy that lives for the devil or whatever, you know? Why me? I'm a good person. I've all this kind of stuff. And I, and I get that. I know that's a wrestling with us. But you have a choice to make. Are you going to look for fault or are you going to look for faith? And God has a way to provide the works uh, the works of God to be revealed in your life. And I love Jesus' response here. You know, whatever you're facing in life is an opportunity for the works of God to be revealed in your life. And we need to be careful how, how we see that because if we focus on fault, we risk believing something about God that's not true. Because if we keep focusing on faith, we'll think, well, we aren't good enough. We didn't do this. We couldn't do this. Maybe he loves somebody else. They're worse than me, my goodness, and they got everything they want. And so if we keep focusing on fault, we risk believing something about God that's not true. And you've heard me tell the story, so I won't go back in its entirety before. But when my dad passed away 25 plus years ago, and he was in heaven, and we just uh, suddenly, and we believe God for miracles, et cetera, et cetera, without revisiting the story. I remember not, short, not long after the fact I was sitting with my mom and just checking on her. I said, Mommy, you're all right. Are you doing okay? And um, anything I can do for you? And she said this to me, so profound. She said, son, you know, my biggest fear was not being alone. I know God would take care of me. I got a family and friends. My biggest fear was believing something about God that wasn't true. And I think in that moment, what is happening here, Jesus is refocusing. Oh, whoa, whoa, let's not walk down that road because we're gonna try and reason and figure out the why and we're gonna, we might come up with a conclusion of something about God that's not true. And the enemy will definitely direct your conversation, your thought life that way. And so my mom said that, it totally changed everything. That's right, no matter what, I believe God. That no matter what the outcome is, I believe God's a good God, he's a faithful God, he's a healer, he's a deliverer, he's a restorer. And in every situation, the works of God should be revealed there. And I wanna encourage you in that. But please understand, God has a miracle for everything. You haven't found the one thing God doesn't have a miracle for. You're not the one person God doesn't care about. You've not run out of your allotment of miracles and God has not run out of his, his power, his miracle working power. But the works of God can be revealed in every situation. I love that. And so let's take a look at three. Let's take a look at verse three again here. Because what happened, I'm sorry, I'll get to that in a second, guys. Verse three, I, I gotta set it up. Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed. So all of a sudden, the disciples are confronted with what they perceive to be an obstacle, and Jesus comes with an answer and sees it as an opportunity, if you will. The disciples are seeing obstacles, Jesus was seeing opportunity, and I'm gonna take a look at three things that we see in the story. Number one, we need to see past our obstacle illusions. We need to see past our obstacle illusion. Now, I know it's a play on words and it's for a reason, obviously. We need to see past our obstacle illusions. Sometimes we get so focused on the obstacle that we can't see God or what God is doing in the midst of it. And I said obstacle for a reason instead of optical, but let me give you a picture to illustrate this. Here's what I mean by an obstacle slash obst optical illusion. When you look at these railroad tracks, it looks like it eventually that they meet, does it not? It looks like it's just coming together. But we know because of railroad tracks, they never ever meet, they run parallel. But it looks like there's an end. It looks like there's an obstacle, a place that they'll come to. And if we're not careful, if we're not focused on faith and we're focused on fault or, or what's happening there, what we see is obstacles instead of opportunity. And so what we have to see is see through our obstacle illusion. 
it looks like there's an end or a dead end there, but there's not. And when I look at my natural, with my natural eyes, it looks like there can be an end to my situation. It looks like there can be an obstacle to my situation. But when you know who God is, he has the last words. It doesn't always be, it's not always what it looks like. You have to see through your obstacle illusion and see through the eyes of faith and see who God is. Now in our natural eye or situation, it may look like there's an end or an obstacle or no way beyond this, but we have to see through to the character and nature of God. We've got to expect the unexpected, position ourselves in faith, remember how much he loves us, release our faith and draw close to him and look beyond the obstacle illusion and see the truth. And the truth is, God is good. Hey, here's the truth. God is my healer. God is my protector. God is my provider. God is my refuge. God is my redeemer. God is my defender. And that is the truth. That's my God. See through the obstacle, the dead end, and see through the eye of faith. See through the illusion of hopelessness. Because he is our hope. See through the illusion of God doesn't care because he cares so much that he sent his son to die for your sin. See through the illusion of there's no way out because he makes a way where there seems to be no way. See through the illusion of it's always been this way. This is how it will always be. But see that God is doing a new thing and he's making a way in the desert. See through your obstacle illusion. See through the eyes of faith. John 9, 4 through 5 says this. I must work, Jesus speaking, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, the night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. What Jesus was saying here is there's things I'm doing while I'm on the earth. I'm working, I'm working miracles. I'm doing what God had me do. I'm the light of the world. Well, then we know the scriptures talk about, it. I didn't have time to put it in there today. Scripture's talking about we carry the light. Now he is in us through the person and power of the Holy Spirit. So while we are in the world, we're doing his works. In fact, the Bible says greater works. So let me say it this way. Jesus was saying, while I'm on the planet, it's the time for miracles. And now he's referring now, while you're on the planet, it's the time for miracles. Now is the time for miracles. When it becomes night, there won't be another miracle needed because we'll be in heaven one day. And you don't need a miracle in heaven. 100% of the people in heaven are healed. Google it. No, I don't know if it's on there. I don't know. It should be. So while you're here, it's the time for miracles. It's the time for miracles right now. It says this in verse 6. And when he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay. God likes to do things different. I already said earlier that he laid hands on a blind man, blind man, and they, were, they received their sight. He spoke to him, they received their sight. And chances are, as this guy came, and he probably heard about the miracles of Jesus, in particular, people around him probably heard about Jesus healing blind people and thought, man, he can do this. He's done it already. Come on up here. So I can imagine that moment with that man standing in front of Jesus and what Jesus might do. And I want to say this. God do, does things differently so we don't focus on the miracle but the miracle worker. So in fact, if you look through scripture, he rarely does anything the same way and he did it for a reason so we won't try and find the formula instead of find the father, right? You wanna find the formula instead of find the father. And we'll trust in a, something else other than God so he won't do it that way. And I, I can't imagine if you can think about in today's world that that was to happen where Jesus spits in the dirt and creates mud and then puts it on the guy's eyes and he goes and washes his heel. Can you imagine today how many people would be walking around with mud? We'd be mud of life, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine that day? The people are always trying to duplicate that, right? And ride the coattails of Jesus or whatever and then are off trying to, you know, get buckets of water and buckets of mud, you know, mud for what ails you over here, everybody walking around, you know, for a shekel, I'll, you know, anoint your eyes with mud or whatever. On late night TV back in that day, it was like give a thousand shekels and you'll get, you know, miracle mud or something in the mail for you or whatever. I don't know. I don't know. Is that too far? Did I go too far on that? So maybe if I would have added all the proceeds go to missions, would that be okay? <laughs> That's a good idea. The point is, we will make something about the formula, formula instead of the Father. We'll look right to the, to the event and, and not the source. And so God did it a different way so we could focus on the miracle worker and not the miracle, but we can learn from it. I believe this man was already uncomfortable in his infirmity, I would assume. I, I, I can't know from having experienced it and the little which doesn't compare to being in a dark room and right in the middle of the night or whatever, getting up and 
Uh, I believe that all of a sudden he's wanting some relief from his discomfort. And what does Jesus do? Probably makes him a little bit more uncomfortable, doesn't he? <laughs> it's like, seriously, what's going on? Can you imagine his friend standing there and Jesus is spitting in the dirt and making mud balls or whatever? The, the blind man might be saying, what's he doing, what's he doing? You don't wanna know. <laughs> he's getting ready, I, I don't know. He's doing what he does to get ready. You don't have to be, in order to receive your miracle in the process, you got to be comfortable with the uncomfortable. It's not always gonna be the same way. Not that you want hope, not like your neighbor got, your friend got, the people at church got. It's not always gonna come that way. Don't expect it to come that way. God has something for you for a reason, for a purpose. But you have to be comfortable with the uncomfortable. What is he telling you that makes you uncomfortable that you're not doing? What is it that you want to happen differently? I want it to be differently, I saw it differently, so maybe you're missing it because you're not comfortable with the uncomfortable. We have to be able to be that to walk out this process. You need to be comfortable with the uncomfortable. When it comes to the things of God, we need to be comfortable with the uncomfortable. It's not always the way we think. Sometimes their miracles are instant and sometimes it's a process. And I know a process is uncomfortable. We all want an instantaneous miracle. We all do, I do, we do, we all do. It's uncomfortable to walk out a process because life gets in the way, logic and reason gets in the way, fear gets in the way, people get in the way. It's uncomfortable, but you have to push through the obstacle illusions and keep your eye on Jesus and push through the uncomfortableness and be comfortable there. The process is uncomfortable. It could be hours, days, weeks, months, years. It could be that we are uncomfortable, but don't give up. If we don't ever, become comfortable with the uncomfortable, we may miss our miracle. That's just the truth of it. And so, uh, let me be a pastor to you for a moment. Your financial miracle might be taking the job he's provided even though you don't like it. Your physical miracle might be stopping doing some of the things, the drinking, smoking, eating bad, whatever you're doing to your body, and do some of the things, make some adjustments he's telling you. Your relational miracle might be quit dating the person because you become unequally yoked and he can't bring you the right one because the wrong one's in the way. Or being comfortable with your singleness right now, don't worry, I've got you. You're not ready. Okay, if I keep going, eventually I'm gonna offend everyone. I'm an equal opportunity offender this morning. <laughs> Feeling a little uncomfortable myself right now, so we'll move on, but you get the picture. I love you, I gotta pastor you. Understand the process for your miracle can be uncomfortable, not the way we want, not our timing, and many times we give up. I don't know, I was thinking about this, popped in my head, the old song, I wrote it this, I wrote it this way, the old song, and I looked really to see the date that it was written, it's the old song right now in today's world, the old song, 2009, <laughs> it's, like the, it's like the old one, I, it's right, way back when, that, back in the day, it was, a, it was a 2009 song, I remember it, my parents were watching something, I watched it on TV, I saw something one time, it stuck in my, I don't know why, maybe I needed it at that moment, I'm almost maybe embarrassed to say this, but it was an old song written in 2009, and it was sang by Tammy Faye Baker, and it's Don't Give Up on the Brink of a Miracle. And I Googled it last night, and I listened to it a few times, and I thought the words were powerful. Don't give up on the brink of a miracle, don't give in, God is still on the throne, don't give up on the brink of a miracle. Don't give up, remember you're not alone. Don't give up. It may be uncomfortable, don't give up. Be comfortable with the uncomfortable. John 9, 7 says this. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. And so he went and washed and came back seeing. Go wash in the pool of Siloam. Point number three, be obedient to what God has said. Just be obedient to God, what God has said. You're, his ways are higher than your ways. You're not gonna understand. It's not gonna make sense to you. It shouldn't. He's God. If it would make sense to you, perhaps you could do it on your own, but it's all from him. And he needs you to trust him. He needs your faith engaged with him. Be obedient to what God has said. Just obey. The man is blind. Now he's got mud on his eyes. And now he's told to go bathe in the pool of Siloam. Now I don't know how far the pool of Siloam was from where they were. I have no idea. But what I do know about the pool of Siloam, the water was crystal clear, crystal clear. And so the priests would do ceremonial bathing there. In fact, people came from all over because the water was crystal clear. They believed it had healing properties. So here's what I do know about the pool of Siloam. It was crowded. So here's a man, perhaps a little bit uncomfortable already in his infirmity. And now Jesus just puts mud all over his eyes. And now he's got to walk through the crowd to the most crowded place in that day at that time. 
push through everybody, people probably looking at him already, feeling uncomfortable. People maybe asking questions, hey, I don't know, but you got mud on your eyes. Why, why are you doing that? I, you know, all these things. Maybe, maybe people asking him questions, maybe people not wanting to give place to him as he's trying to get in this pool with mud over his eyes. Uncomfortable, even more uncomfortable, and now having to walk to this place. And I wanna say this that your obedience releases the miracle working power of God in your life. And it's important for you and I to know that because we can't go from miracle to miracle to miracle and hoping and believing from instantaneous and God does it that way sometimes. I don't know how, what, why, where, and where. But I do know we can all be obedient to the word of God every day of our life. Every day of our life we can all walk out the principles in the word of God. Be obedient no matter what happens. Obedience is huge. When you search through scriptures, many miracles come through just being obedient. So the good news is we can all obey the word of God. The bad news is we don't always want to. And so if you're like me, hey God, can I just have my miracle? I don't wanna do this, I don't wanna do that. I don't wanna go there, I don't wanna go here. I don't wanna forgive him, I don't wanna forgive her. God, can I just have my miracle? And I believe God would look down and say, Don, can I just have your obedience? Because Don, if I have your obedience, you won't need so many of my miracles. Amen. And then him, I would say, oh, snap. No, I never, I never say that. I don't know why. It's been the Holy Spirit. It's being obedient. Thank God for the miracles. But if he can get your obedience, we won't need so many. Why? Because obedience brings a blessing. In fact, let me read Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 13. I'm gonna try and read all this. Hang in there with me. It's on the screen. It's in your live notes. But just listen to what the word says. Now it shall come to pass if you diligently obey, obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city, blessed shall you be in the country, blessed shall be the fruit of your body, produce of your ground, and the increase of your herds, the increase of your cattle, and the offspring of your flocks. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in and blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise up against you to be defeated before your face. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing on you and your storehouses and all to which you set your hand. He will bless you in the land which the Lord God is giving you. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself just as he sworn to you if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. Then all the people of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord and you shall and they shall be afraid of you. And the Lord will grant you plenty of goods in the fruit of your body and the increase of your livestock and in the produce of your ground and the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. The Lord will open you to his good treasure, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in its season and bless all the work of your land. You shall lend to many nations and you shall borrow not. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail, and you shall be above only and not beneath. If you heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and carefully observe them all. Amen. There's a miracle in obedience. There's a miracle. This is a miracle Bible. This is a miracle word. Yes, this is a house of miracles, but this is a miracle Bible. If you do what it says to do, the miraculous it's happening and operating in your life. John 9, six through seven. I wanna reread these and give you one more thing before we close. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground, made clay with his saliva, and listen to this next phrase, and he anointed the eyes of the blind. Man, so we just, he rubbed mud in his eyes. No, 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 he anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which translates sent, and so he went and washed and came back seeing. He anointed the eyes of the blind man. Anointed. That's a big church word. Anointed. Anointing. We want the anointing. The anointing is the power of God. The anointing is the covering of God. The anointing. That was an anointed message. That was an anointed moment. The anointing breaks the chains. The anointing brings healings. He says he anointed the eyes. The anointing. Anointed. The power of God. We want the anointing. And anointing here means applied or covered. He anointed, applied, or covered his eyes. Here's what I see. When they, covered, when they covered or anointed his eyes with the mud, he didn't all of a sudden start seeing, did he? It wasn't like an anointing there for an instantaneous miracle. He still had to go all the way to the pool and wash off. Listen, please, please, please hear me in this. When the eyes were anointed with mud, 
then he had to walk to the pool and wash. So I wanna say this, the anointing is just as strong on the process as it is on the instantaneous. Amen. I should've got a bigger amen on that. The, the anointing is just as strong on the process as it is on the instantaneous. So don't discount the process because you didn't get the instantaneous. Maybe God wants to work a miracle through you in you a different way and he needs your obedience. Obedience to God releases the anointing in your life, in your situation. And just because you have to walk out a process for your miracle does not mean it's not anointed. And just because someone got an instantaneous one doesn't mean that they were more anointed than you are. And so we don't line up behind pastors and preachers and people that seem to have some kind of, I know God operates that way. Sometimes he does it that way because we think they're more anointed than someone else. You know what's anointed is the word of God. And you operating in the word of God. I don't discount anybody's anointing. I have an anointing on my life. I get that, I get that, I get that. But let me tell you what, church. Don't believe the lie of the enemy that the process is not anointed and you missed your miracle. Just don't give up. Be obedient. Be obedient. Obedience to the word of God brings the miracle working power of God. There is an anointing on the process if you'll be obedient to the word of God. My heart, my hope is to encourage you Listen, I'm so excited about next Sunday. And I want you to pray all week and get ready and invite people that need a miracle. We're gonna believe for the miraculous power of God to be present. We do every week, but to be present, to create an environment so we can step into that place of faith and receive either instantaneously our miracle or direction for our process, which is just as miraculous. But I believe right here, right now, you can receive what God has for you. You can receive what God has for you. You have to look through the obstacle illusion. You have to be comfortable with the uncomfortable and you have to be obedient to the word of God. God works, there's a miracle for all of us. Every head bowed, every eye closed.